the Honourable Dr. Jamin Ramesh, MP, my fellow uh, Aqua Board member, uh, Dr. Tharoor and Mr. Dinehoven, Mr. Waija, and Madam President of Air Quality Asia, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Air Quality Asia, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for taking time in your busy schedules to help develop strategies for transition towards a green economy in India, including the promotion of renewable energy alternatives and building a zero emission transport ecosystem. Honorable Ramesh, Honorable Dr. Tharoor, distinguished members of parliament, Honorable AQA board members, expert panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are witnessing an unprecedented time, a series of global challenges due to COVID-19 pandemic and the exacerbations of climate change. Over 2 million lives have already been lost to the pandemic. As tragic as this current outbreak is, there is another silent killer that continues to claim lives daily around the world, and that is air pollution. According to the World Health Organization, air pollution kills close to 9 million people every year by now, more than AIDS, malaria, and TB combined. There's also evidence that COVID pandemic mortality is worsened by over 15% because of air pollution. Some scientists have also suggested that air pollution particles may be acting as vehicles for viral transmission. Members of Parliament who are gathered here today along with their parliamentary staff, I want to particularly underscore that parliamentarians played an instrumental role in the global agreements on clean air. AQA, a parliamentary advocacy group, works with key partners in Asia to implement this global framework. Air pollution is an accelerator of climate change. The same carbon emissions that speed up global warming make air quality worse. Air quality monitoring, however, allows policymakers to make a real-time progress measure. The right to clean air was proposed at a parliamentary meeting in November 2013 at the UN by the Parliamentary Working Group on Clean Air. Clean air language was negotiated in the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 by September 2015 with strong targets signed by all governments. The three clean air SDG 2030 targets, as you can see, are specific. They lay out the sources of air pollution and the implementation to be undertaken by governments. UN agencies such as WHO, UNEP, Habitat, etc., are the assigned monitors. The World Bank, Asian Development Bank, um, and other development banks are affiliated agencies to help governments fund the implementation. Since 2016, AQA has been working with high-level policymakers to implement these clean air uh, SDGs uh, through strengthening their environment and energy policies. Since 2020, um, AQA has added work on the two key process goals for transitioning to a clean air economy, how we generate the energy for industry, for our homes, and how we ensure clean transportation. The challenge for South Asian governments is enormous. Of the world's cities with the highest air pollution, 40 out of 42 are in South Asia, 34 are in India. In addition to the majority of deaths from respiratory illnesses, such as asthma and COPD, air pollution also causes 36% of deaths from lung cancer, 34% of stroke deaths, 27% of deaths from heart disease, and we also now, of course, know that it is uh, related uh, in the morbidity rates for COVID. According to research by the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution, these air pollution deaths have a bell curve. They rise as countries move from low income to lower middle and upper middle income and drop as they reach high income. Why is that? Because our means of generating energy, our means of production, our transportation systems remain polluting while higher income countries have had more access to technology solutions that are green and clean. That differential is now changing rapidly as green energy, green production technologies are spreading across the globe. And they're not just coming from the so-called developed countries. 
India, as an example, educates over 1 million engineers annually. Many of these global advances are the result of their work. Most important for policymakers is how will countries pay for the transition to a clean air economy? Part of the answer lies in transitioning the current cost of air pollution to the economy. As you can see from the World Bank 2016 report, India's air pollution then had a 7.8% negative GDP impact. Later reports show a higher percentage as air pollution levels increased. Applying the 2019 GDP, apply, the same percentage applied to the 2019 GDP figure, uh, the loss is over 200 billion that is leaking out of the Indian economy due to air pollution. We know with global data, that air quality improvement policies work and generate economic benefits. Um, thanks to our friend Manish Bhapna, this slide shows um, that according to the IMF, every dollar in renewable energy or sustainable land use has a multiplier two to seven times larger than fossil fuels. Your colleagues in parliaments across the globe are enacting green economy bills and programs. I want to share one example from the Philippines, a country also impacted by climate change, where a slew of bills have gone through both the Senate and the House through activist parliamentarians. The latest House Bill 9181, the Philippine Ecosystem and Natural Capital Accounting System or PENCAS law of 2021. Uh, by AQA member, Deputy Speaker, Honorable Lauren Regarda, will mandate a measurement in Philippine pesos of the cost of environment destruction. She says we, what we can't measure, we can't regulate or improve. So it's time we start to measure both the profit and the loss of our natural resources. We know nature restores itself if man's destructive activity can be curtailed. Within weeks of the COVID-19 lockdown, air pollution had dropped dramatically across the globe. And as you can see in Delhi, blue skies had returned. I saw photos from uh, Jalandhar showing the Himachal peaks, which people hadn't seen for decades. But of course, we can't permanently shut down the economy. And if policies are not changed, pollution returns. So we must and can build back better. We know from data from California, Europe, Mexico, Chile, China, that air quality improvement policies when applied do work. India is also on that path with the National Clean Air Plan. State and city governments are also following up with state level plans. But with monitoring, there must be targets, timelines, emission standards for power plants, industry, transport, including moving to electric vehicles. The one example that I have used, and it has really affected both me and many people, was shared by um, Drew Kojak of ICCT. This is a clear visual of the soot going into all our lungs, depending on which Euro level fuel is currently allowed on our roads. Euro 6 or an e electric vehicle would, of course, be an empty bottle. Implementing a transition to a clean air economy in a democratic system with a growing economy, which is India's, is truly challenging. In addition to legislators' role on laws, regulations, budgets, fiscal policy, it is their crucial role as communicators to convince constituents, local industry magnates, small business owners, even farmers. For parliamentary staff that are joining us today, um, as this is our first hybrid session, your role in supporting your member of parliament's work on environment and climate is an important contribution to the health of your people, your country and the planet. Air has no boundaries, either within nations or across nations. And we at Air Quality Asia will continue to support all your work for our right to clean air. Thank you. We now move on to um, our keynote uh, speaker, and my, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Dr. Jairam Ramesh. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this interaction this evening on an issue that um, 10 years ago, 
uh, we took for granted when I was in the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Uh, people looked at me very suspiciously uh, when I raised issues of air pollution, particularly, uh, and its link with public health. But uh, a decade later, uh, we have become far uh, more conscious uh, of the need to do something dramatic, uh, something really dramatic on air pollution as part of the process of economic growth. Uh, and today there is increasing concern and awareness across the country that uh, it is extracting a huge uh, cost from us, both in terms of morbidity uh, and mortality. Mortality attracts the headlines. Morbidity is the silent killer. Uh, but of course, air pollution is part of a, a larger concern, a larger debate that we have been having. Uh, we have problems of water pollution. Uh, water pollution is equally an important issue in India. In fact, uh, we had passed laws on water pollution much before we uh, passed laws on air pollution. Chemical contamination is a very serious issue. Uh, land degradation uh, is, a th is, a, is another issue. And of course, global warming uh, and climate change and its impact uh, on various dimensions of Indian life whether it's the monsoon, whether it's the sea level, whether it's the forests, or whether it's the glaciers. So air pollution is, uh, is, uh, has become a national issue. Now, let me say that um, India actually has a fairly robust system of legislation. We passed our water pollution law, control law in 1974. We passed uh, the original version of the Air Pollution Control Act 1981. And then, of course, we have a slew of other environmental laws that were passed in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we also have a very large network of institutions that are mandated under law, um, you know, to enforce the rules, the regulations and the standards. Our problem really is, is an enforcement, uh, not so much in the lack of legislation. And I think we need really need to look at new methods of enforcement. Uh, because the old uh, method of enforcement through the inspectors, uh, through the command and control type of a model of enforcement uh, has run its course. And I remember when I was the minister, uh, we had started a project uh, to look at market-friendly modes of uh, enforcement of regulations, much along the lines of how the U.S. controlled the acid rain issue. Uh, that's been taken forward in some states of India. But I would suggest to you that uh, the a productive line to pursue for the, in the future is to really look at new modes of uh, enforcement, new modes of monitoring, uh, new modes of evaluation, uh, and go away from the old systems of command and control. Uh, you know, we, the traditional view in India has been that the coal in India is low sulfur coal, and therefore we don't have to be we don't have to worry about sulfur oxides or nitrous oxides, but that clearly is, is a flawed assumption because in, in totality, uh, when you total up the emissions, uh, you know, we are amongst the top two emitters of both the nitrous oxides and uh, the sulfur oxides. So there is a case for, uh, for looking at the standards once again. Uh, there is a national clean air program that uh, uh, was talked about earlier that's been launched in, in, in many cities. Uh, but, uh, you know, the funding is still uh, at, at, at low levels uh, and uh, considering the magnitude of the problem. But I think a beginning has been made uh, uh, in, in, in some parts and certainly in the capital city because it attracts not just the national headlines, but it also attracts, you know, global headlines. I think one has to recognize that there are multiple dimensions to uh, this environmental crisis that India faces. Uh, you know, as I said, there is the water dimension, the water pollution dimension. Uh, there is a climate change dimension, uh, and it's not uh, it, it's not uh, it's not apparent to me uh, that we have come to full grips uh, with the issue. Uh, but nevertheless, I think um, you know we 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 are we are today uh, engaged in this debate, particularly in the context of economic recovery after COVID nineteen. <laughs> Uh, and um, the great danger, of course, is that we will look at environmental laws uh, as a constraint to foster economic recovery. 
Uh, we've already done it in the case of labor laws. Uh, and my concern in parliament, and I've been raising this repeatedly, is that in the name of faster economic recovery, for God's sake, let's not uh, take a short-term perspective on the enforcement of these laws uh, and, uh, and you know, try to think that by loosening and weakening the laws, uh, you know, we, um, we are going to have a faster recovery. I'm so glad that the World Bank has discontinued the ease of doing business index uh, because one of the great, one of the great um, it was very seductive. You know, here's the World Bank doing all these rankings of countries. Uh, and uh, if you look at regulatory regulations as a burden, uh, as, a, as a constraint to ease of doing business, then you will automatically target environmental laws. Uh, I think today there is a there is a there is a greater uh, there is a greater political awareness, political concern uh, in in India, uh, both in the state governments as well as at the federal level. Uh, and I think the important thing really is, as I said, to convert this concern uh, into a sense of seriousness uh, as far as enforcement of laws, professionalizing the institutions, uh, giving them the autonomy uh, that they deserve. Uh, and looking at industrialization and urbanization uh, from a sustainability point of view. Uh, you know, growth has to be rapid uh, in India. That's a given. Growth has to be inclusive in India. That is also a given. But growth also has to be sustainable. So there are three pillars to economic growth. It has to be rapid growth. It has to be inclusive growth. And it has to be uh, sustainable growth. Now, we've made some, some commitments in Paris uh, you know, uh, as part of our nationally determined contributions. Uh, a lot of this uh, debate will take place in the run-up uh, to Glasgow, uh, the transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, but I do want to uh, enter a word of caution here. Uh, given India's demographic challenges, given India's democratic, uh, sorry, developmental challenges, both demographic and developmental, a phase out uh, of fossil fuels in India uh, in the next 15 to 20 years uh, is, uh, is simply not feasible, neither is it desirable. A phase down uh, of the use of fossil fuels is eminently doable, uh, and of course, it is desirable. So I think we should work out, uh, we should be less evangelical and more realistic uh, and more practical that in the next 20 years, what we are looking at is a phase down of the use of fossil fuels. But of course, there will be niches of the economy and transportation is certainly one example where the phase down of the fossil fuel can be accelerated. And we can in fact think of a phase out of fossil fuels uh, in, the, in the next 20 years. But remember that the phase out of fossil, fossil fuels uh, raises not just technical issues, not raises not just technological issues, but it's, it raises issues of political economy, center state relations, uh, the dependence of different provinces of India uh, on revenues uh, from mining, transportation, use of fossil fuels. So there are complicated and complex concerns. And I, for one, in spite of all my commitments, uh, you know, to the cause of the environment, I've always been saying that net zero uh, for, an in, for India uh, is, is, is simply not uh, an achievable target, even by uh, 2050. Uh, you know, it's very easy to announce a target for 2050. Uh, we, none of us are going to be around in 2050. Uh, I mean, some of you might, Shafi might be, but I certainly won't be around uh, in 2050. I think it's more meaningful. Uh, I think there's a cop-out. Uh, cops are really cop-outs. And every country is busy announcing net zero targets for 2050, which are really meaningless in my view. What we have to do is to look at intervening milestones. What are we going to do in 2025? What are we going to do in 2030? What are we going to do in 2035? And that's, I think, uh, what was mentioned. We set targets. We, uh, we, uh, we, we identify a trajectory. Uh, we put up monitoring systems. And most importantly, we hold ourselves accountable. We hold ourselves accountable domestically. We hold ac ourselves accountable uh, internationally. One of the great uh, regrets of mine in the Paris Agreement is that the system for holding countries accountable internationally is yet to be put in place. We have announced the nationally determined contributions, but what is the system to ensure uh, the integrity of the information that governments are putting out? That, that remains a big question mark. 
as far as the Paris Agreement is concerned. So uh, there are many other speakers. I just wanted to make a few opening remarks. Uh, I think the time is uh, ripe uh, for, uh, for intensifying the debate, intensifying the engagement uh, with the federal government, with the state governments, uh, with local governments, uh, you know, many local governments also, city governments uh, are becoming much more aware uh, and much more conscious uh, of the need to do, uh, you know, something meaningful in the area of air pollution. But while we address the issue of air pollution, I think it's important to locate the air pollution issue in the larger canvas of environmental issues uh, that in, in concerns that India faces. So thank you, Shazia, for this opportunity. Uh, we are now going to move on to uh, panel one, uh, which is a transition to a green economy. And the moderator uh, of this panel discussion is the Honorable Sata uh, Yatta uh, Waida, who is a member of the National Energy Council for Indonesia and is also a senior advisor to Air Quality Asia. And thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nolans. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been honored to be moderating uh, you know, for the panel one, it is quite uh, quite important topics. is transition to a green economy. But before that, yeah. before I introduce all the panelists, but I'd like to uh, give you some uh, information with regard what's happened in Indonesian parliaments in the past because we form the uh, green economy caucus within the parliaments. It is a quite a uh, you know, big movement at the time, so back in 2012 where all the committee within the parliament, this consists of 11 committee, we're trying to gather all the parliamentarian who has the same interest on the uh, green economy uh, you know, issues, particularly when uh, Indonesia at the time was facing with the, uh, the preparations to, uh, to endorse the uh, uh, climate, uh, climate change uh, Paris agreements. So we need to get the support from, from the parliaments and you know, because of that kind of movement within the parliaments, with the caucus, this has become uh, easier for the parliamentarian to, uh, to ratify the Paris Agreement back in 2016. And now this uh, Indonesia trying to uh, face what's so-called the energy transitions, because our commitment to reduce the emission, uh, you know, up 29% by 2030, which is around 315 uh, uh, million ton CO2 by 2030, yeah, this is using the business as usual. But if we do have an international aid, it, it goes up uh, to around 700 million ton CO2 by 2030. So which is 41% of the CO2 emission reduction. So that's that's a quite uh, ambitious program. And, uh, but we'd we'll, we'll like to uh, see uh, you know, the support from the parliaments and also the government uh, program with all the NDCs and the National Determined Contribution that has been signed. And we are going to revise a little bit, you know, on the Glasgow meeting uh, for the next uh, couple of weeks from now. So in order to strengthen the position of the Indonesian government on the NDCs program. So let me uh, yeah, introduce uh, probably the first speaker is uh, Mr. Justin Nygaard, is Senior Environment Specialist, the World Bank Group. So, yeah, it's a pleasure for me uh, and on behalf of my institution, the World Bank, to do a brief a presentation here on what we are referring to as a clean air 2030 vision for India, which we believe uh, also will have substantive impact on a, on a transition to a green economy which is the topics of this session. So if we go to the next slide, what we basically have tried to be working on uh, over the last uh, couple of years is to look at what is the pollution situation in India? And they are also working on this in the, rod, the larger sub-regional South Asia context. So if you look at the photo here or the map here on the left upper left-hand side, it really illustrates the various particulate matter concentration levels up 
by 2018. And you see the tremendous concentration levels you have in the Indo-Gangetic Plain all the way from the border, even including in Pakistan, Punjab, all the way to Northern India, part of Nepal, uh, and even including uh, Bangladesh in the eastern part of the plain. So, and, and this concentration, when you were referring to the high concentration levels in the North China plain, where I spent about 12 years of my lifetime working on improving the air quality there, I, I can with fair confidence say that the challenge we are facing here is even more serious than what we worked with in the North China plain for, for a few years and decades back. Now, the good thing is that already a lot of initiatives are going on. A lot of measures are taken in India, here in India, that will have substantive impact. So what we did was that we looked at the various initiatives, the policies, the measures that have been taken in place up to 2018 to 2019, and basically then projected what would be the impact on particularly diluting the heavy particulate matter cloud hanging over the Indo-Gangetic Plain, plus additional improvements throughout India. So if you look at the next map here, you will see with the current measures you will have substantive dilutions. There will be improvements. But at the same time, one will not be, as far as we can see, able to completely dilute substantively the, the overall particulate matter cloud and also to further do improvement. So one need to do additional measures to the current policies. So what we have tried to do here is to look at various scenarios where we say, okay, let us put in place all known measures by today in order to, to reach the next WHO interim targets. And, and, and you know, the interim target structure for the WHO is a little bit tighter than the first most relaxed are that the India's own, PM 2.5 target of 40 micrograms per cubic meter. The next one is 35. And what we basically project in the large map to the right-hand side is that by applying the known measures we know by today, one will basically be able to eliminate the cloud over the next about one decade. Um, this is also what we see being the most far most cost effective way of improving the air quality by basically looking at which sectors will have most effect. So one do not do all measures, one focus on the most cost effective measures. Please go to the next slide. So here, what we have tried to do here is to look at then what, how far can we improve the air quality in the various Indian states by applying the known measures we have by today. And what you see here with the red colored dots for each of the Indian states are basically today's or 2018 concentration levels. And this is where we have, we have basically taken the Indian CPCB own monitoring data, combined them also with over projected uh, concentration data, which actually fits pretty well. So you will see here, for example, Delhi being the most polluted, Bihar following, Haryana following, and particularly the Indo-Gangetic plain states here on the left-hand side and the remaining states uh, to the right-hand side. And the dark yellow part, is really how far one can improve the air quality in each of the states by 
applying all known measures of technologies that are proven worldwide. What they basically come up with is here a ranking of what are the most important sectors to focus on in order to be able to achieve the clean air vision that we have outlined here. So, so these are basically what we have discussed with the 15th Finance Commission, with the Minister of Finance, with the Ministry of Environment, and so on, of being main initiatives one has to do. Thank you very much, Mr. Justin, for your clear uh, explanation and strategy in, for the India Clean Air uh, in actions. I, I, probably the, the strong word here that you just mentioned is about the coordination is quite important. So coordination among the states and also the, across the ministries, including the power plant, transport, industry, household, and agriculture. I think this is the key one, you know, in order to develop what's so-called the clean air economy in India. So I think um, now I go to the second speaker is Ms. Fibuti Kork, the energy economist from the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, from the perspective, from the financing perspective, and we are talking about this whole big issue of transition to a green economy. So yes, all the countries have been victim of climate change, which have led to floods in some places, to extreme droughts in the other countries. And recently, the occurrence of such events have increased multifold. So while the concept of uh, green economy has been doing rounds for some time now, but there is a greater need to have it formalized and like in any other SDGs, facilitate countries with the required technology and finance. And finance becomes very critical in you know, pushing uh, uh, different countries to adopt to green transition. So when COVID hit the world last year, it gave countries an opportunity to reset you know, by directing investments towards green stimulus. However, what we saw that, you know, support in most of the countries was again skewed towards fossil fuels. Um, even Fatih Birol, executive director of International Energy Agency, also kind of urged countries to put clean energy at the heart of stimulus plan. So support measures while protecting people and, you know, um, Helping industries to cope with the crisis must also combine environmental measures. So that becomes the crux of, you know, whenever we are talking about any uh, planning that takes place, any stimulus packages that gets announced by the government. So this needs to be at the core of any uh, support or any policy that is being framed now. In March this year, IFA, along with IISD, you know, we came out with a report to specifically assess how green is India's stimulus for economic recovery and how India can further raise its ambition to, for a green stimulus in 2021. Uh, this analysis was done for the energy sector alone. So what we found out was that there were about more than 70 energy-related policies uh, that were announced uh, since the beginning of January 2020 uh, till about March 2021, which committed more than US dollars, you know, 120 billion to the energy sector, uh, out of which on the face of it, it looked like the renewable energy related measures received almost twice as much funding as fossil fuels. However, uh, you know, there's a caveat, both uh, these policies were dropped by uh, measures that were being supported uh, given to the other sectors. And this uh, support to the other sectors comprise largely support to transmission and distribution companies in the power sector, which is likely to disproportionately benefit fossil fuels more than the renewable energy. So depending upon whether the government promotes more fossil fuels rather than the clean technologies under such programs, you know, will decide whether the uh, skewness was towards uh, clean energy or towards fossil fuel. So I'm just going to quickly uh, give a few recommendations that were being given as part of that report, what needs to be done in order to push for more green stimulus. Uh, first is strengthening green industrial policies. So as part of restarting the economy, the government should invest in uh, capacity to manufacture for the green energy revolution. It includes domestic manufacturing of solar modules or even electric vehicles. There are many states who have come up with uh, good policies, 
but it needs to be strengthened and further more and more states needs to come on board. Secondly, investing in large scale RD grid integration. So while wind and solar are uh, competitive now and are cheaper, but we need more flexible uh, generating resources. And uh, India needs to start investing in the system for tomorrow. Thirdly, improving energy access. So increasing adoption of distributed renewable energy sources and energy efficiency measures. These are both very low hanging fruits and can help uh, elevate disc combos and also help in more job creation as well. Um, compliance with environmental norms. Uh, Dr. Jairam Ramesh already talked about what India needs to do in order to kind of, uh, while these norms have been existing, but you know, uh, continuous uh, extension of these norms is not a good sign. So India needs to strengthen again, complying these environmental norms. Uh, Lastly, or uh, I would say there needs to be an improved targeting of subsidies and fossil fuel taxation. And lastly, unlocking finance. So government should work on resolving policy and legacy issues to attract the financial institutions to bring in more capital to the deflationary and uh, pushing more domestic manufacturing as well in the renewable energy and in the electric vehicle and the new technologies like battery storage, uh, green hydrogen, which are becoming increasingly the focus of the government. So some of these points have already been highlighted by uh, the earlier speakers. And while I believe that India has the right intent, we might have to accelerate our pace of deployment. And this would further help India achieve its target of economic growth and job creation in an inclusive, equitable, and more importantly, in a sustainable manner. So thank you. The last speaker for now is uh, uh, Mr. Manis Mahulkar. is a former VP IFC advisor, Green Climate Funds. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Yuda, for that kind introduction. And, and thank you, Shadia, for inviting me to this very interesting and very topical, very timely discussion. So I'll build a little bit on what my fellow panelists have already uh, covered very well and, and share a little bit of... Uh, um, my perspective from the private sector end of things, and particularly as it relates to financing this, this transition, improvement to air quality, but as well as the broader green transition that we have been talking about. Um, now, just a couple of uh, thoughts based on some numbers. Uh, there, is, there is this expectation or has been this expectation that somehow the, the uh, financing, particularly of this transition in developing countries, needs to be supported by, um, by official aid or by, by government level financing. Um, and as you know, at the time of uh, the Paris Accord, there was a commitment from the developing of the developed countries to transfer, to provide about $100 billion of financing by 2020 uh, to help developing countries uh, you know, manage the green transition. And with all the efforts that have been made, the establishment of the Green Climate Fund at that time, many of the multilaterals now, um, you know, put about 30 to 40% of their annual financing into climate related projects. And yet we are not anywhere close to even that $100 billion number, let alone the much larger number, probably in the trillions that will be required eventually in the coming years to continue on this path. Uh, whether we call it net zero or we call it, you know, give it some other target. But the fact is that we have to um, figure out a way globally to reduce not just pollution, but overall emissions, as, as was commented upon earlier, uh, in, in order to keep the world, uh, you know, even, even at its current equilibrium. Um, so what strikes me is that the financing that is needed for this transition has to come substantially from the private sector. And it, it needs a much larger scale of mobilization, uh, both at the national levels and as well as at the, at the global levels. And another statistic I want to share with you is that as it happens today, uh, there is a large, a probably large pool of excess capital sloshing around globally. There is something like 14 to $15 trillion of investments in the developed world that are earning zero to negative interest rates. So we have this interesting paradox. We have large pools of excess capital looking for better returns. And we have this huge need for financing to, uh, in order to you know, manage 
the transition to a greener economy. So the big opportunity here is to link the two. And I'm glad Dr. Ramesh uh, mentioned in the beginning that much as the progress that has been made towards uh, effective legislation, uh, which has been very good, but now we need to move away or move from that traditional enforcement model. That means expecting people to follow laws, which are often seen to be contradicting with or putting hurdles in the, in the path of business to a different system, a different approach. And, and that different approach to my mind is essentially about uh, looking at this climate transition as a, as a big investment opportunity for growth, right? That's, that's, I think, the big difference. And at the end of the day, I think there is a certain, uh, there is a certain extent of inevitability about this transition. It's an existential problem for the world. So if, whether it's a matter of 5, 10, 15, or 20 years or longer, uh, the world has to move to these newer, greener, cleaner technologies. So the question then for the developing world, countries like India, uh, you know, other countries in Asia and the emerging world is, do we want to be uh, chasing this? Do we want to be following and waiting? Or do we want to get ahead of the curve and work towards the plan to leapfrog towards new technologies to which the world is going to move to in any case? In a sense, this is to my mind an opportunity as big as, if not much bigger than the whole digital transition that is going on today. Right, and in some ways, some of the countries that uh, that might have missed the whole growth opportunity from manufacturing and exports that China and some of the Southeast Asian countries were able to capture, this is actually an even bigger opportunity for countries like India uh, to to get behind. And what does this mean? It means that uh, beyond legislation, now there needs to be. Uh, and I think this was mentioned earlier as well, there needs to be clear sector level strategies and plans that make uh, investing in these sectors more attractive for the private sector, right? So, so this is not about forcing somebody to do something, but making it more attractive to, to generate projects that are investable and to get that, attract that capital, which we know is sitting there looking for investment opportunities. And the clearer these strategies are, the clearer the pathways are, and the clearer the policies are to support that, over the long term, the more you will attract this money. So it's actually a, a fairly, um, you know, in a sense, a symbiotic or a synergistic transition that can be managed with the right approach to this, rather than looking at it from a, a kind of a point of view of a, a big challenge or a hurdle that somehow people have to be forced into doing things. And um, the second aspect of this, of course, is to make sure that we build better and better metrics, the data, transparency, disclosure, and measurements that are hugely important because ultimately you want to measure, you want to measure progress. If you don't measure it, you don't, you don't make those improvements, but then linked to those data and metrics should be clearly uh, identified incentives to give people uh, the benefit if individual companies or investors actually achieve those targets. And that's how you can get a much broader participation in this transition and you can get a much larger scale mobilization of resources um, than what, was, what would be possible only through a purely governmental uh, approach. And the last point I would like to make is the right way to think about uh, the, the, the uh, linkage between public and private in terms of financing this transition is for, the, for governments, whether it's national governments or uh, through multilateral or bilateral channels, uh, government to government transfers, to look at government funds, the public sector funds, as uh, essentially providers of high-risk capital or what we call today blended finance to, to de-risk and support these investments so that you can leverage that money uh, in, multiple, in multiples of that number to get more private sector into these projects rather than uh, private and public competing with each other for, you know, for projects that could be done more easily in the private sector, more effectively in the private sector. But then what is just needed is that, that uh, de-risking or blended finance support, which can attract that investment. If you look at from the panel number one, so from uh, Mr. F Mr. Johnston Naikor, is very much focused on the uh, policy thing. The coordination among the states and the ministries is quite important. And emphasizing also by Ms. Fibudi Corks about the technology and finance and you know, closing by Monis Mohukar on the on the detail on the financing scheme that need to be to be done. I think this is uh, uh, the end of this panels, uh, the first panels. So we move now to panel two, 
and uh, it is the transition to a renewable renewable energy. And uh, our first contributor uh, on this panel is uh, Mr. Bharat uh, Jara, uh, Director Energy, uh, World Resource Institute in India. Uh, let me start by outlining a report that uh, we published, uh, WRI published in 2016 uh, in partnership with uh, Prayas Energy Group, Regulatory Assistance Project and, and others. Um, this report uh, looks at the future electricity grid. Um, and while this was a global report, it looked at uh, several uh, key issues that were also facing India. Um, and I want to use this as a backdrop uh, because in 2016, we'd already begun to notice unprecedented growth and plunging costs uh, of renewable energy sources, particularly wind and solar. Uh, we've also began to see growing instability in fossil fuel supply and in prices um, and strong support from governments, uh, not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world uh, to and as well as from investors for renewable energy. Uh, and we also learned one very, very exciting new thing, which was the electricity generation uh, was beginning to happen by new and different entities, and that we no longer needed only large fossil fuel-based power plants to generate power, and that smaller renewable energy plants uh, were equally capable of uh, generating power that was needed. Um, and let me uh, let us have no doubts. Um, India's renewable energy uh, transition is well underway. Uh, please see this uh, pie chart um, that shows India's installed capacity of, of power. Uh, this is as of uh, September 21, so current. India also has aggressive renewable energy targets by 2030, and this is part of India's NDC uh, uh, to, as, as part of its climate commitments. Uh, by 2030, 40% of India's total installed capacity will be from non-fossil fuel. And you can see in the pie chart, we're already at 39.7. Uh, so we're already almost there in 2021. Um, also by the end of 2022, India seeks to achieve 175 gigawatts of renewable energy. Um, and last month, we, uh, we saw the announcement uh, by the uh, Honorable Minister of Power uh, that we'd already got to 100 gigawatts of non-hydro renewable energy uh, as of August. Um, we also have set ourselves a ambitious 450 gigawatt target of renewables by 2030. So all of this is to, to just reconfirm that the destination, and that by that I mean the renewable energy transition, that is clear and that the journey is, is well underway. Now, energy demand patterns are changing uh, with new entrants like uh, the electric vehicles. Uh, I know we have a, a session just after this that's devoted to that, but also increased focus on digitization and electrification sorry, uh, of um, uh, industrial processes and so on. Technologies in, or like solar and wind are intermittent by nature, um, and um, as are some other technologies in the supply side. So, the issue of convergence here is also quite important uh, because we, we have different sectors making different decisions. Uh, oil and gas is making certain decisions. Chemical industry is making different decisions. Uh, transport making different decisions. Power sector making different. So the, the, the transition for this to be sort of sustainable in the long run is going to have to focus more at the convergence. And the lack of convergence today uh, is a big challenge. Uh, and let's not forget that this is all of this is within the large, the backdrop of an existing big issue in Indian, the Indian power sector, which is the financial indebtedness um, of electric, electric utilities or electricity distribution companies. But the transition uh, provides some opportunities and we, we would do well to ride some of, on some of these tailwinds. So let me conclude by just restating these uh, few points. India's transition to renewables is well underway. Uh, the coal versus renewable sort of binary argument is fairly inadequate and we really need to be looking at a more holistic integrated energy mix, which marries the techno-commercial with the uh, social 
sort of political uh, e political real, uh, uh, political economy realities uh, within which these decisions are made. Um, and for the transitions uh, to for the transition to renewables to be sustainable, uh, we must look at not just technologies but also reliability, resilience, and finance. And finally, the transition uh, must not further the inequities of the current energy regime. Uh, thank you, and back to you. We now move on to our second panelist, uh, and uh, the second panelist in this uh, panel discussion is Ms. Uh, Kanika Chawala, uh, Program Manager, Sustainable Energy for All. Thank you, Mr. Nolan, and thank you to AQA for having me and also for just organizing this. And, and I like the way that you stacked the different topics because recognizing that they all kind of flow into each other, these are not isolated conversations. So I want to talk about the phrase energy transition a little bit. And what does that mean for a country like India, right? So I think that there is, it's important to understand that there is growing energy demand, there is existing energy capacity, and then there is a new type of um, fuel that we are transitioning to. So there's, there's kind of a few different transitions that are happening. There is a transition around growing energy demand because of energy access, because of um, greater industrialization, and as well as, an, uh, as a growing economy. And so how are you going to power India? And that's one, one question, and that is a transition in itself. Um, the second one is kind of the renewables versus fossil fuel kind of discussion. Really important to think about that one as well. Um, and then the final one is to think about which sectors of our economy are going to change in the way that they um, use fuel. So I, what are you going to electrify? What, are, what, is, what cannot be electrified and what is going to be kind of the, the transition in, in a sectoral mix or an end use of energy consumption? So I want to talk about this in the way of if we, if the goal is to kind of become a renewables rich energy system, which I think everyone on um, this panel can agree. And I think that, you know, um, the, it, right at the top of the session, we heard around about why that's really important, not just from an air quality point of view, but really kind of to be integrated into the future of uh, uh, global energy um, mix. What does that look like, right? So, so I think it's important to think about how do you do more renewables? How do you do less coal? And what that means is how do you do no more coal and how do you retire existing coal, right? So I'm going to kind of talk about these three pieces. So how do you do more renewables is the bit I think that Bharat's covered really well. Um, but but I, if I could just kind of run through that piece really quickly, um, it would be to think about what is the new market design? Um, can we stop trying to... Um, use the same market that we already use today. So whether that is in, in the way that we um, dispatch power, whether it's in the way that we consume power. Um, and that's a piece that I feel like is often most underrepresented in, in academic or, or you know, intellectual discussion around this topic is consumer behavior. Uh, we, we think of energy only as a supply side push and while it's easy to do that because an electron is an electron, regardless of what is the fuel that is used to generate it, you are not going to get uh, energy transition at scale unless every citizen of this country, of India participates in the energy transition. So how do you make renewable energy aspirational? How do you make it exciting? How does it, and this is especially going to happen when we start electrifying things like transport. How is, how is it, why should it be something where people kind of are amenable to charging their vehicle at a time where demand for overall electricity is low? Is only if you educate them, if they get to participate in this transition, if they feel like there is, uh, and there's enough evidence of, um, uh, of studies that have been done, not just in other parts of the world, but in India that suggest that the, the consumer behavior is what's going to propel uh, transitions forward. It, it's always tricky and it's always hard and it's we're a very large country and et cetera, et cetera. But we underestimate the, the power of savings for an Indian populace. And this is what demand side action can do, right? If you are able to kind of engage um, an average household in the energy transition, there's, you're just going to get scale and pace in a way that you wouldn't if you didn't if they didn't participate. Um, so, so one is kind of to think about um, how do you do, as I was saying before, more renewables, how do we kind of drive behavioral shift, again, on how does regulation keep up with policy, but also we need to think about innovation, right? And the minute I say innovation, most of the people listening in today are probably going to think about technology. 
But technology innovation is the only one that happens. We need innovation in business models. We need innovation in financial design. At the moment for a household to get a loan for a rooftop solar um, addition to their house, they need to put their entire house as mortgage, which is a fairly ridiculous thing. If you want a loan for a couple of hundred thousand rupees, you need to put an asset which is in tens of millions, um, which does not happen anywhere else. But that's just because we haven't created a secondary market. There isn't we haven't educated the, the loan manager at the branch, right? While we may have TCFD discussions at a management level of banks, how does this all trickle down? And one argument is eventually we will move from the margin to the mainstream and all of this will happen automatically. And while that may be true, we don't have the luxury of time. And so what are some of the levers to accelerate that pace? And so while when we think about you know interventions, capacity building is one that's often looked upon to be fairly, you know, fluffy, let's say. It was like, what is what build capacity are you going to build? But that to me is the real lever that India has left unaddressed because we have made policy reform. We have done, regulation doesn't keep up with policy, but there is there is effort to, to kind of shift the needle on that. Um, we are doing a little bit more on thinking about what a new market design can look like. How do you bundle? How do you use energy storage? Um, but we just are not shifting the needle on um, on on finance on decision making at non policy levels, and that includes private sector, that includes households, that includes financial institutions, and it often also includes uh, concessional capital and decisions on how that is spent. Um, we heard from Monish before around the role of um, you know grant money or concessional capital. And it, it, it cannot be used for, for uh, project financing anymore. The scale of the problem in India is, or the scale of the opportunity in India is far too large to use very, very precious concessional capital to do project financing. You need to use it in catalytic ways. So that's kind of my, my piece on how do you accelerate renewables. Then the much trickier piece of the transition of how do you reduce the share of coal? So of course, as, as the share of renewables increases, the share of coal will go down. The economics of renewable energy are so compelling that at the margin, renewables are the cheapest source of capacity that you can add. Increasingly, that is becoming um, true even when you think of um, energy plus storage and, it's, and the, the economics will only keep improving, right? But there are other social economic as well as political economy issues that keep coal very deeply entrenched in the Indian economy and the Indian society. Until we don't think of these two as interconnected issues, we're not going to be able to solve them. However, if you were to think about this in a strategic way, what while the country cannot face to you know, lose jobs for millions of people, um, you know, lose revenue for, for several states as well as for the central government, what it can also not do is basically deal with another financial crisis. Uh, and the, the writing is on the wall with the, the with thermal assets where there is so many law, I mean, there's, it's, it's not a revenue generating business that's going to last for a long time. There are existing kind of supply shortages, there is uh, delays in payment, et cetera, that already make thermal power and unviable business, but increasingly because of climate risk and transition risk is gonna, the, the, the value of thermal assets is only going to decline. So there need to be kind of good economic business models on how you can decommission um, assets. And there are examples from around the world. There are examples that are deep dive studies that have been done specifically for India that suggest that there are several, you know, cash for clunkers, repurposing, uh, better matching of, of efficient plants with, with uh, coal supply, just to, to have economic gains, which if redistributed, could actually address some of the, the social, economic, and political concerns that are, are kind of linked deeply with the transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chawala, um, for your very uh, interesting uh, contribution and certainly outlining the challenges being faced by India uh, as they move uh, in order to try and transition to a renewable energy uh, format. Um, our final speaker on this panel uh, is uh, Mr. Simran Grover, uh, CEO, Basque Research Foundation. Uh, of course, Rajasthan has huge potential of renewable energy, uh, 140 plus gigawatts of solar, 120 plus gigawatts of wind energy, 
It also has extremely ambitious uh, state policies or goals. 20, uh, by 2024-25, we are the state uh, uh, aims to achieve uh, 30 gigawatts of, uh, of, of solar and another uh, uh, about two gigawatts of wind uh, from a current state of about five gigawatts of solar and 4.7 gigawatts of wind energy, right? Uh, coming to the transition, I think uh, renewable energy is no longer a question of cost. That question has been done and dusted. Uh, right now, uh, it's, it's, a question, uh, it's, it's a challenge of demand. Uh, but along with it's also increasingly becoming uh, a challenge of a social challenge as well as, well as environmental, environmental challenge. Now, social challenge is something Kanika always uh, also discussed with, uh, but some of the uh, 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 resistances on the ground are coming from areas on the Western Rajasthan front, uh, which uh, are low productive. Often uh, there are legacy issues regarding classification of lands. And there's a difference in opinion of, class, of, of value of land, of the, it being classified as, as fallow or wasteland versus its value to the local communis, uh, communities and, and, and especially the pastoral uh, communities who are intricately linked uh, to the species of land, even while uh, you know, uh, being very low uh, productive uh, 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 in terms of per, per square foot or per unit area, are extremely essential for the survival. Uh, secondly, of course, there are challenges regarding the retirement of thermal uh, assets, which Kanika again hinted towards. And the challenge uh, essentially lies with a larger number of people that are employed indirectly, uh, which are contractual uh, skilled and non-skilled laborers, which have spent more than 20 years of life uh, serving uh, those assets directly or indirectly uh, working in extremely hazardous conditions uh, at, at uh, marginal incomes and next to, next to none uh, capabilities uh, uh, being, uh, being gained over that period, which may help them to transition to other opportunities or deal with the shock which may come with the uh, decommissioning of the plant. On the environmental side, of course, uh, Renewable enjoys a special privilege of uh, you know, not undergoing economic impact assessment, which, which to an extent is a democratic process where communities can re represent their concerns and dialogue with the developers, with the, with, the, with the government on whether a project should come or not. And there are of course other technical aspects to it of assessment of what, how is going to the impact the, uh, the environment uh, of the concerned site, right? Uh, uh, we are well familiar with the state of distribution, poor uh, performance of distribution companies, the state of fiscal distress, uh, which has which leaves, leaves them with little room to invest in transition and plan for the transition. Uh, but more than that, there is also the issue of institutional motivation uh, as well as capabilities. I say motivation because in Rajasthan, uh, our, uh, the Rajasthan state generation company has a portfolio of about 7.4 gigawatt and seven gigawatt is thermal, uh, most of which is coal and a little bit gas, uh, rest of it being uh, uh, hydro. Uh, and even within the uh, state uh, uh, distribution companies, including the generation company, there's hardly been any discussion on the discourse on raw roadmaps on clean energy transition and managing the same. Uh, the other issue being the capabilities, uh, and uh, uh, we have seen that uh, and uh, capabilities in. Uh, or let me just say that uh, with renewables, electric vehicles, and other non-wire alternatives, uh, grid management and grid planning is obviously becoming extremely complex. Uh, but if we see the capabilities of the state institutions on planning, uh, they are far too limited. Uh, to begin with, Rajasthan uh, 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 plans just for five years as of date, right? Uh, whereas uh, 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 integrated planning uh, uh, typically, as per experts, require a minimum horizon of 10 years, uh, often more. Uh, and that is very critical if we are uh, envisaging a change in next 10 years. Uh, I'll just jump now to some of the suggestions that I have, and I think the political leadership has a strong role to play. And the primary uh, 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 suggestion I want you to make that it's important that the leadership internalizes uh, the commitment to climate action and clean energy transition 
what it means that it should uh, start with why we are doing it and followed by how do we do that. With that, I hope there will come a conviction which will help us move away from the dichotomy of great legislations, but poor enforcement that just Mr. Jairam Ramesh earlier pointed to. Uh, some of the other suggestions uh, are, of course, institutional building. Uh, uh, we need to ensure uh, social and environmental justice. And lastly, a very important point, uh, point I would like to mention is public disclosures. Uh, it, it might have been very ambitious in the past, but I think Rajasthan has set the precedence uh, of public disclosure for various public schemes and policy through the Jan Sushna portal, an absolutely fantastic portal, which is revolutionizing access to information at the last mile. I think, I think implemented to transition and climate action, this is also revolutionize and democratize the whole process of uh, climate action and energy transition. Thank you. Uh, I am now calling on uh, Mr. Sunil uh, Dahaya, who is an analyst with the Center for Research on, on Energy and Clean Air. Thank you, Mr. Nolan, uh, for, and uh, Quality Asia for giving me this opportunity to contribute to the discussion. Uh, taking it uh, forward from the earlier speakers, uh, uh, the energy landscape globally and in India has changed drastically uh, over the past decades. Uh, renewable energy, which once was seen as an expensive proposition despite of clear environment and uh, climate benefits is no longer an expensive source when compared to uh, coal or any other uh, fossil fuel. As we know, uh, India has been uh, the battleground where uh, the cost of renewable has fallen so drastically that now new renewable or any kind of renewable is even cheaper than the variable cost of uh, most of the operational coal-based power plants and definitely uh, of, uh, compared to the new proposed coal-based power plants. The new coal-based power plants, which might supply electricity at a uh, rate of uh, uh, INR or rupees 5 today, is way too expensive proposition compared to renewable energy options being available at 2 to 2.5 uh, rupees. So the argument of, uh, uh, yes, renewable energy is clean and climate friendly, but what about the economics uh, has been done away with? That's the question which we faced uh, over last decade. Now, the second biggest argument uh, used against renewable energy over the last decade uh, was uh, that it, uh, the, the argument which argued that renewable energy isn't available 24-7 uh, and we, that's why we can't rely on it. Even that argument is kind of becoming redundant as, as well as, uh, as we are moving ahead with, with the new hybrid renewable energy options such as wind, solar and pumped hydro as well as other uh, storage capacities are developing and improving at a faster rate. Uh, uh, because of uh, the reasons uh, which I just mentioned, uh, it is very critical for India to, number one, move away from the dirty fossil fuels as soon as possible, uh, as, as mentioned by the earlier speakers. And secondly, whatever remains of the fossil fuels, we, we can't shut them, shut them down uh, all in one night or, or in a day or even in a year. Right? So there will be fossil fuel capacity which will remain. What we need to ensure is to trap pollution at source so that the full solutions such as sucking air from the open air space using gigantic smoke towers uh, does not uh, suck in the energy, money, and resources, which can better be utilized for, for developing renewable energy solutions. So to sum it up uh, for action and strategic focus uh, moving ahead, I would reiterate that uh, to be able to push forward on an energy transition journey in an aggressive and sustainable way, making sure the economy, quality, environment, and, and uh, social aspects of, uh, of these communities dependent coal are in uh, synchronization, complement each other. We should, number one, ensure uh, that uh, we get rid of all polluting uh, fossil fuel capacity, which will reduce air pollution burden and climate change uh, will be good from climate change perspective, as well as uh, save money by not needing to retrofit these power plants uh, to control the pollution. And it, it will be uh, it will also uh, lead to uh, rearrangement of power purchase agreements with lots of discounts because we, we have all heard that discounts uh, are a loss making uh, uh, enterprise uh, uh, in in the Indian power sector and there needs to be lots of reforms which need to uh, be brought up into transmission and discount uh, system in, in India. So when these power plants are shut down, they, they will be the discounts uh, or, or the distribution agencies will be freed from uh, paying unnecessary uh, thousands of crores of, of rupees to these power plants for the electricity, which they don't even buy from these power plants. And that's only because uh, they have signed long-term power purchase agreements, which runs for 25 years. Uh, and, and they will be freed uh, if, if these power plants have been 
shut down. The other uh, aspect uh, is that there, there are lots of coal-based power plants which are still uh, under construction and in, in pipeline. Uh, what we also need to do, looking at the whole capacity situation, as well as uh, the development of renewable energy, uh, coming up of hybrid renewable energy models, the falling costs, and uh, improvements in the battery storage uh, technologies is uh, do away with any new investment uh, in the at least early uh, construction stage coal-based power plants and the pipeline uh, coal-based power plants which have not started construction yet. And that money uh, can be saved from uh, being put into future non-performing or standard assets and be better utilized uh, in the renewable energy development. We should also stop on uh, the, the uh, other issues, the economic saving done from these two measures, uh, we will ensure its de deployment into the renewable energy technology development, which can fuel uh, renewable energy uh, growth. And when we move on that path, we need to ensure, uh, because Bharat also uh, uh, and the earlier speakers also mentioned that uh, the large uh, scale solar is also becoming a problem because of uh, few lacunas of not having an AI and not having a consecutive process and all the things. Uh, what we have to do is move uh, forward to more uh, uh, concentration on the decentralized renewable energy uh, models because uh, it, it will not just not uh, do away with, with lots of social concerns, but it will also lead to generation of power at the point where it is being utilized or uh, consumed. And uh, we finalize the remarks now, please, when you're ready. Thanks, uh, Mr. Nol. I'll, I'll finalize. 30 seconds. So uh, th th that being uh, done, what, what will happen is we'll also do a transmission losses uh, in the distribution system and, and uh, we'll ensure that there is efficient usage of electricity being generated at the consum consumer sites. So uh, that, that's uh, how uh, I would like to put, put, put the arguments uh, or, or points which I had for the session. Uh, but apart from that, uh, there is a lot uh, going on in terms of different sectors where the policy is not being synchronized and we are still investing heavily into coal mine and other coal sector. And that needs to stop because any new investment in the coal sector is a wastage of money and it's uh, building up of future non-performing assets. Uh, thank you again uh, for giving me a chance to uh, contribute to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to uh, panel three. Uh, transition to a clean air transportation system. And for this, I'm going to hand over to my fellow uh, Air Quality Asia board member, uh, the Honorable da uh, Harry Deinhoven, uh, who is also Secretary of uh, AQA. Kia ora tato, morena. Good morning from New Zealand. Thank you, Michael, MJ, for the introduction. Uh, we have an interesting panel uh, today with four speakers. But it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists. And our first uh, panelist is Dr. Anup Bandavadikar, who is the India Director of the International Council on Clean Transportation. Now, when it comes to vehicles, um, we've actually done a lot. And I think, you know, we should sort of take stock of what we have done and really where we need to go. Uh, and I sort of list the kinds of policies and tools that are necessary to reduce vehicular pollution in these four very big buckets of you know, policies that affect new vehicles, policies that affect the fuels that we use, uh, policies to control emissions from in-use vehicles, and then really managing the overall demand uh, that directly affects uh, air pollution from vehicular sources. Uh, as most of you know, India transitioned to Bharat 6 uh, tailpipe emission standards for on-road vehicles in April 2020. In the middle of a countrywide lockdown, uh, India transitioned uh, uh, essentially overnight on 1st of April 2020, where all new vehicles sold in the country now follow the BS6 emission standards, which are more or less similar, uh, not quite exactly, but quite similar to Euro 6 emission standards that are in force in the European Union. Uh, one of the most important elements of this is that all new diesel vehicles sold, four-wheeler cars or trucks, now come equipped with a diesel particulate filter. Uh, which essentially eliminate 99.5% of the PM emissions. And it's it's got a very interesting greenhouse gas 
emissions benefit that effectively these filters also eliminate black carbon emissions from all of these diesel vehicles. And so this is uh, an achievement not to be underestimated. India should be very proud of having accomplished this. What's more important is that India is also on route to have what are known as stage five tailpipe emission standards for non-road vehicles. That means agricultural tractors, construction equipments, et cetera. And by 2024, even those equipments and machineries will have a diesel particulate filter uh, on them. Again, a major step forward, India will become the only place after European Union to have adopted such standards. They are not yet in place in China or in the US uh, at this time. So it's, again, something we should be aware of, something we should be proud of uh, and know about. Uh, but that doesn't mean, you know, it's done. Uh, the world-class emission standards on these fronts, you know, if you look at uh, the tier three emission standards that are in place uh, for passenger cars in the U.S. or the kind of Euro 7 passenger car uh, standards that are being discussed or heavy-duty uh, uh, tailpipe emission standards that California is discussing, they are anywhere between 70 to 90 percent more reduction from the BS6 emission standards limit. So while we should be rightly proud of what we've accomplished, we should keep in mind that there is another round of these regulations that needs to happen within the next five years or so if we are really to clamp down on tailpipe pollutions from these IC vehicles. Uh, combine that with evaporative emissions, which are particularly important for gasoline vehicles in India and two wheelers, which are again, a very India specific fleet with large numbers of petrol driven two wheelers, but also passenger cars. Uh, evaporative emission controls in India are not up to par, uh, especially given the atmospheric conditions in India. Uh, I think something has been said already about, you know, stronger compliance and enforcement program uh, on these vehicle types. And of course, we need, you know, greater promotion of electric drive vehicles. And India, again, has done good in terms of uh, putting in place fiscal incentives to promote electric drive. What India isn't doing is actually having a regulatory action on this front that requires vehicle manufacturers to make a certain percentage of their new vehicle sales to be electric drive. In California, several states in the US, parts of Canada, China, uh, South Korea now, uh, all have such a zero emission uh, credit program in place that now needs to happen in India. On the fuels front, fortunately, uh, the BS6 transition uh, accompanied uh, these ultra low sulfur fuel deployment. And we went into 15 different cities across India before BS6 transition and after BS6 transition, and we tested fuel quality. Uh, I'm glad to report that you know the sulfur content of these fuels was very low in single digit parts per million. Uh, again, sort of a very remarkable accomplishment for India uh, that we should be proud of. Uh, at the same time, as I said, evaporative emission controls at refueling stations, not up to the par, and, and a lot more work that needs to be done on that front. When it comes to in-use fleet, uh, really, we are doing much worse uh, when it compared to how we are doing on new vehicle policies. Uh, and none of the programs that I list, whether using onboard diagnostics for improving our inspection and maintenance programs, using advanced techniques such as remote sensing for uh, determining compliance of in-use fleets, um, you know, we aren't really doing well. And the government has proposed recently a new scrappage policy which I call you know, a scrappage light policy because of its nature. It's voluntary in nature. It has got few fiscal incentives in place. Uh, we should expect very modest, if any, real impact from this scrappage policy. Uh, if we want to do this, we are gonna have to turn our focus to 
retiring heavy duty vehicles, particularly BS3 and older BS3 vehicles, compensate those uh, who have these vehicles in place. And without appropriate compensation, these vehicles are very likely to stay on the road for another decade to come. It's one of the opportunities that is yet to be exploited. Uh, we have looked at the retrofit possibilities and, and this question always comes up. And, and what I can say is, as long as we are dealing with very old vehicles, BS1, BS2, BS3 vehicles, uh, these simply need to be retired. There is no salvation for these vehicles through retrofits. It's only BS4 vehicles that came into effect in 2017 in India. Once they get older, or even now that we have got ultra low sulfur fuels, those could be retrofitted. Uh, but if you know ideas come up for retrofitting of older vehicles, we should know that this is not a cost-effective solution. We should just you know steer away from that and get rid of those older vehicles, not try to retrofit them. And then finally, I'll, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just talk about the the demand side things that at local level are uh, being quite effective in other parts of the world. Uh, and these are city level policies, uh, whether they are in terms of uh, fees on uh, polluting vehicles, such as what Delhi is trying to do with the environmental compensation charges, or what many European cities are doing in terms of low emission zones, increasingly moving towards a zero emission zone. And these are going to be incredibly important policy tools that local authorities can use. Uh, much of the Policies listed above are not in control of the local authorities, but creation of low emission zones, enforcing them, collecting fees on polluting vehicles, restricting their entry are incredibly effective tools at local level that will accelerate transition to cleaner vehicles in a short order. Uh, so let me let me stop there, uh, but I think it should give you a sense of the policy opportunity space that we have uh, going forward. Our next uh, speaker is Ms. Ashkima Gate, the principal of Rocky Mountain Institute of India. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. I think I'll, given the time constraint, I'll just quickly jump into a few points that I want to make. And when we are talking about transition uh, to clean mobility, I just want to focus on the topic of transitioning to electric vehicles. I think. Where we are today is very critical because if we are starting to talk about this transition, I think uh, one critical message is that we are at a very nascent stage as of now. If you're looking at globally, you know, what's happening, uh, we are less than 1% of our new vehicle sales being electric as of now. So what has been really driving uh, India to EVs, of course, you know, they're it's primarily driven uh, by energy security concerns. And there is also an interest you know, for the government to use this as an opportunity, uh, you know, to uh, grow manufacturing in clean mobility technologies. And to me, you know, air quality, climate change are more secondary objectives, but really the primary objective that has been driving India over the last few years, I feel, is energy security. There have been several, uh, you know, initiatives that have been taken at the central at the state level, which have provided a really strong foundation for the EV uptake. So while I showed, you know, while we are very low in terms of numbers, uh, we've also putting in place over the last two, three years, very, very strong policy frameworks, uh, which will hopefully, you know, now start showing the results in terms of adoption. We have a good balance as of now of demand-focused policies and supply-focused policies. Uh, I won't go into these, but I think the key message that we, you know, uh, I really wanted to share here is that there is enough in terms of, uh, you know, budget outlays in terms of supporting the transition. We have a budget of $1.4 billion uh, for EV incentives. We have a budget of uh, outlay of $2.4 billion uh, till 2025 for supporting ACC battery manufacturing. There have been several regulatory reforms by the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways that aim to encourage EVs and, you know, uh, to some extent, discourage ICE vehicles. And whole set of reforms uh, that have been taken by ministries like Ministry of Power, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs to create that supportive ecosystem for infrastructure and vehicle operations. 
uh what is also been interesting is that you know while most of you know what we see in the ev sector was driven primarily till say about to, you know 2016 2017 by the central government uh last 3 4 years you know starting 2017 2018 we've seen a lot of interest uh by state governments to have strong policy frameworks as of now we have uh, almost you know 15 states that have notified ev policies 10 more states uh, you know are developing their uh, ev policies so where we are you know uh, today and what could the future of evs in india could look like these are some scenarios that we've been doing and you know we, there is a big opportunity for us to perhaps have a stock of nearly 20% uh, you know evs uh, in our vehicle stock uh, you know by 2030 uh, and of course you know a lot of it would come from passenger vehicles uh, but you know the reduction that are possible in terms of emissions you know significant savings would come uh when freight also you know freight vehicles also shift to electric vehicles there are significant economic value we're talking about air quality but beyond that also there's significant economic value in this transition we're talking about significant oil savings for the country co2 emission savings and of course uh the air quality benefits that will entail beyond that we're also talking about an economic opportunity uh for the country in this transition uh that you know india has the opportunity to capture but what would make it real um, this is i'll probably you know conclude here rather than going further is early deployment will be very very critical if we have to now start reaping the benefits uh, of what we have set over the last 2 uh, to 3 years in terms of uh, the you know policy ecosystem um when we look at some of these schemes uh, where they are we find that uh, still you know um sorry i have a power cut but i can continue speaking uh so some of the you know schemes they are midway but they are still to show their results so uh, i think there is a need for a big push to get the vehicles at least you know which are being targeted under different policies to be uh, you know coming on the ground um i showed about uh, state ev policies coming lots of reforms coming at the state level uh, but implementation challenge exists there is a need for significant hand holding capacity building given the nascency of the technology and the subject particularly you know if also the policy makers who've never dealt with uh, with these vehicles in terms of a policy subject so a lot needs to be done on that front uh, there is an uh, you know definitely a, a huge opportunity So yeah I'll just conclude I think uh, my main message is that you know we are at thousands we need to move to millions uh, and that would require a lot of capacity building it would require some amount of mandates and push uh, and uh, you know uh, definitely more market creation and awareness so yeah I'll stop at that thanks thanks for to the organizers for this opportunity and next uh, and thank you our next speaker is mr gerald olivier lead transport specialist of the world bank group thank you very much and i, I know i'm coming very late in the in the series so even though i have a 22 slide presentation i will not go through uh, all of it uh, for sure in details but anyway it's a it's a great opportunity great di- diversity of uh, people and you know actually um when we look at air quality management as a world bank we really look at it comprehensively so justin is part of the same team we are looking at it nationally cities uh, and states as well as the uh, indo gangetic plain in a comprehensive approach i will share the slides so that you can look at uh, how we are looking at it and the reason is simply because the co- the problems are complex they are multi sectoral uh you know in transport is really primary pollutant but also the secondary uh, pm 2.5 that comes from uh, nitrogen o- oxides uh, that are created and, and those are very significant in terms of the pollution so there, there is a, an opportunity to think differently uh we are looking at uh that air pollution across uh, the the air shed as opposed to just a city and it's quite instructive because then it shows quite rapidly that yes transport may be not such a small part of pm 2.5 in some cases but when you look at secondary emission the role of the overall air shed and the role of the uh, conversion of nox into pm 2.5 becomes very significant when we look at the fleet as uh, anoop mentioned earlier you know you have the big offenders the heavy duty trucks the buses 
etc., the older vehicles that disproportionately pollute. And you know, when you just look at Delhi and take uh, the uh, the transport part, that's enough to exceed uh, the, the the target for all sectors in terms of uh, of pollution. So it gives you a sense of the the challenge uh, being faced. Now the the, the the ways of dealing with that are quite well known, and they really deal with the part that I covered. You know, the improving the fuel, but they also improve uh, deal with the volume of traffic and how this traffic uh, moves around. Now, I still like to show that graph because it's similar to the picture we saw at the very beginning, uh, presented by by your president, um, in the sense that. As we move from one generation to the next, I mean, the, the factor of improvement is very substantial. I mean, 35 times or 20 times, depending on the type of, of pollutants, uh, as you transition from the old vehicle, old fuel to the new ones. And therefore, the acceleration of a transition becomes absolutely critical to achieve rapid progress. Now, when we look at urban mobility, which was one of the topics I was given, it's much more than just clean transport. It needs to cover a full spectrum that uh, I'm sure you know pretty well. And ultimately, the challenge is not so much a what to do, but how to do it. When you think about the program that could deal with massive multi-level impacts, you look at urban bus services, and you look at the way a program of 150,000 buses, which would be more or less the, the existing gap in the number of buses in uh, urban areas in India would lead to massive reduction in PM emission as well as carbon emission plus other mobility gains. But to do that is more than just buying buses. It's changing the type of system that I was showing on the previous slide and thinking about how do you deliver sustainably and effectively those services so that they can last and that's part of a challenge that we as a World Bank are looking at, thinking about a process that brings the state and the city through, you know, the thinking on the vision, efficient delivery, funding it, and scaling it all the way through. Now, I'm coming towards the end, but if you were then to say that same program of 150,000 bus was to be electric, you would save additional tons. So in this case, I show 1,000 1, buses. So... Uh, you know, ultimately um, important to think about the different groups, to think that time frames and market segments are going to be uh, manifold and need to have a plurality of solutions as you move forward. Clearly, moving out the existing polluting vehicle of the road is a top priority while integrating EV, uh, accelerating the EV uptake. But for that, you need institution, you need funding to be reorganized holistically. So uh, I know it's a very short uh, <laughs> delivery of 20 slides, but I hope uh, that may have been of use. Our final speaker in this panel is Mr. Polash Mukherjee. He's the lead in air quality and climate res resilience in RDC India. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dan Owen. Uh, good evening and good day to everyone. Uh, uh, I have the... Uh, I have the unenvious job of being the last speaker, so I'm just going to uh, quickly talk, uh, talk about my remarks. So much has been already said about the crucial linkage of air quality and public health. In Indian cities today, uh, there is increasing local localized epidemi epidemiological evidence generated in the country, which was often pointed out as, uh, as a shortcoming in the earlier years. Within this, the role of the transport sector stand out, stands out as a sector that punches above its apportioned weight, specifically in terms of exposure and toxicity. Most air quality uh, source studies in India, in Indian cities, uh, wherever available, focus on total emission quantum as well as geographic spread. However, uh, line sources and vehicular emissions have near universal reach. And this combined uh, with the widespread uh, road dust that is seen in Indian cities forms a very toxic combination. Uh, my organization, NRDC, uh, along with partners, has been working with part, uh, partner city and state governments to engage more uh, strongly with the clean air plans under the National, National Clean Air Program, the NCAP, uh, as well as the finance commission grants, which were mentioned earlier. 
uh, to meet the NCAP targets and exceed them. Uh, so I'll restrict my remarks here to some of our learnings, specifically from the city's perspective. Uh, so while these funds have been made uh, performance uh, performance link, uh, as well as a supporting ecosystem has been enabled uh, in terms of the national knowledge network, regional as well as local governments remain critically understaffed and uh, very often lack the technical know-how to develop as well as implement effective pollution control strategies. Uh, while the city governments own these air, 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 uh, clean air plans under the NCAP, their engagement with these plans so far, in spite of the performance link component, has been perfunctory at best. Uh, the institutional structure of NCAP notwithstanding, many of these cities depend on the state pollution control boards to develop these plans, uh, as well as the interventions themselves are then uh, implemented by various line departments in silos in an output-oriented approach rather than an outcome-oriented one, as mentioned by Mr. Nygaard uh, from the World Bank. National level clean air intervention, uh, interventions in the transport sector, which were mentioned by my co-panelist earlier, such as the advanced, uh, advanced implementation of the Bharat Stage 6 emission standards, uh, the fuel efficiency standards that have been rolled out, uh, remain. However, most state governments remain mostly unengaged with these strategies. Electric mobility is an exciting new sector that has been given big push. Uh, even here, the push uh, remained at the national level for, for a long while. But uh, uh, positively, in recent years, we have seen state governments and cities now taking a keen interest in taking a lead in this area. Specifically for transport sector interventions, many cities lack deeper uh, mechanisms, mechanisms for deeper engagement with the state government for transport sector intervention and equality. Uh, in NRDC's experience, uh, cities have expressed an in inability to influence local transport sector emissions outside of the interventions linked to traffic congestion uh, or for measures that strengthen the public transport infra infrastructure. In our view, uh, the city government can uh, play a key role in two segments here. One is to create the infrastructure and the incentive to ensure modal shift towards more efficient public transit systems. And the second, uh, crucially, is uh, the last component of Mr. Anup's slide, uh, is to ensure compliance with existing transport sector emission norms. So the critical area here is to ensure emission control, in particular from the legacy fleet of older uh, vehicles that comply with older emission standards, if at all. The national scrappage policy launched in India uh, is definitely a start here. Although, like, uh, uh, like Anup mentioned, it leaves several uh, opportunities unaddressed of ensuring better circular economy and so on. For cities, however, it represents an opportunity to initiate interventions for targeted fleet renewal to remove in particular the most polluting vehicle for the street, from the streets. Uh, heavy vehicles in particular, which were mentioned by uh, Mr. Gerald as well, uh, buses and trucks, along with high usage commercial and passenger vehicles are particular segments that need a focus. Uh, the, this combined with the finance commission funds uh, represents a sizable opportunity to, to deal with uh, these legacy vehicles effectively. NRDC is working with partner cities to implement these and other air quality interventions, uh, in-use vehicle uh, emission control as well as demand management, uh, demand management measures as spoken by Dr. Anup are a key focus area. The idea here being that uh, to enable the local governments, uh, the city governments, as well as uh, the, the sub-national sub governments to focus uh, and build these linkages that have been discussed in this panel and others. So therefore, localized context-specific solutions for transport sector emissions remain a key part of the overall resolution of India's urban air quality issues, along with national and sub-national pushes. Thank you. And now uh, it's my happy duty to uh, welcome the Honourable Dr. Shashi Thora, uh, who is going to, Dr. Thora is going to uh, convene the next panel, if you like, uh, a summing up and we're in your hands, Shashi. Thank you all very much. And I am delighted to see you all. I know it's been a, a very, very good discussion from everything that I've seen and gathered. And I'm, um, I'm, I'm very pleased that, um, You've had this this excellent day, uh, which, uh, to be honest, um, I would have loved to have been a part of throughout. And so let me thank the Honourable um, Harry Dinehoven 
uh, and and uh, the Honourable Satya Vidya Yudha for their earlier contributions. Uh, from AQU, AQA, we've got Shazia Rafi, the President and Convener, and my dear friend of many decades. I think neither of us will want to admit how long. Uh, and uh, the Honourable MJ Nolan, the Treasurer, who've all uh, been stewarding this discussion. Uh, and, and I'm really grateful that you have uh, come in. We've taken advantage of the webinar format to assemble such a distinguished gathering from around Asia and around the world to focus on this discussion. Now, very simply, our flagship program in India, uh, since the inception of the whole AQA effort here, uh, which was five years ago now, has been the annual roundtable series, which has been convened annually and grown considerably from its genesis in the first closed door edition that I had convened in July 2017. Um, and so we started about five years, just under five years ago, had the first meeting in July. Uh, I brought together civil society stakeholders, technical experts, communications professionals, and even senior healthcare practitioners, like the current director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, into a discussion on how we could collaborate and develop a comprehensive strategy to address India's crisis of toxic air. But um, I'll be very honest and say that initially, um, we, we didn't indeed uh, get enough of a buy-in from a very important target element, namely the parliamentarians, the legislators, who are so key to finding solutions to this crisis. Uh, this is a critical stakeholder group whose interventions are vital, and, um, and the political class had to that point remained largely apathetic to the issue of air pollution, which was confirmed, by the way, when a large number of those I invited failed to show up. So uh, I had an excellent 100% turnout of all the experts, the doctors, the healthcare people, the NGOs, civil society, and, and a very modest, I think three MPs showed up at that first meeting in 2017. Now, um, we have now been able to make a lot of progress in that area. We have expanded the platform, we've roped in more parliamentarians and even government officials. And today we had the chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee. Uh, last two years, we were able to get the Minister of the Environment and by working closely with major actors like the Observer Research Foundation in 2018 and the Energy Resources Institute, Terry, in 2019 and 20, we've really made good headway um, in producing a broad enough umbrella so that federal parliamentarians cutting across the political divide have come to the table to discuss the issue of clean air. Um, and at the same time, frankly, the issue itself has been gaining in salience in India so that our efforts in some ways were ahead of the curve. Now we are surfing a very big wave that I think we can really take uh, to the top of the public policy agenda. But in India, to be very honest with you, the issues of clean air, and one could even argue the larger issue of climate action, has largely been the domain of judicial action and civil society-led activism. Uh, and, and even something like a new national clean air program hasn't really uh, uh, been implemented effectively. There are real questions that people like me have raised regarding limited funding for the initiative, the small number of cities that have been included, given the scope of the problem we're facing, the capabilities of policy to enforce compliance. I gather that Jairam Ramesh, uh, who, who inaugurated today's meeting, highlighted that enforcement is practically non-existent in India. So all of these gaps that we have been pointing out between policy uh, articulation at the top and ground realities at the bottom, these are the kinds of gaps that legislators, both the state and central level can come together to address, but sadly, they haven't been doing it. And this is the opportunity that we believe we very much need to seize. The lack of engagement by the political class is a challenge for us. If we're going to campaign for clean air, which is what AQA has been doing for the last few years, then we really have to move faster than we liked. And what's good, as Jairam has mentioned, is that awareness among the political class is gradually beginning to grow. Um, the sort of famous green shoots everyone likes to talk about appear to be appearing. And um, in the post-pandemic era, we really have to push this through. There has been a real uh, impact, I think, of the growing research on air pollution and COVID-19 mobility. I mentioned this in my speech in Parliament on, um, in, the, in the one clean air debate we've had in the lower house. 
Uh, there's research by Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health suggesting that uh, the lethality of COVID-19 is exacerbated by air pollution. Uh, and they took uh, uh, data from 3,000 counties in the U.S. that even a marginal increase in long-term exposure to PM 2.5 have contributed to a higher fatality rate amongst those affected with coronavirus. Um, there's been, as I said earlier, a, a beginning of a mindset change within the political class. Um, we, we all realize that uh, public expenditure on healthcare is too low and that um, uh, healthcare expenditure is also exacerbated by the horrendous toxicity of the air we breathe. If the voters and the public representatives can both recognize the value of health as a public good, which they've done so because of COVID and the hospital bed crisis, the oxygen crisis, all of this have opened people's eyes to the public health challenge, then I think um, they can also be persuaded to engage with issues like clean air. Because if we have cleaner air, we might have less of a health public health crisis as well. So this enhanced willingness to engage in matters of health, personal well-being, and the environment is where we need to take this forum. And I believe this growing recognition that the silent killer of toxic air affects us all, no matter which part of the country we come from, what political and ideological affiliation we may have, uh, or indeed what socioeconomic class we find ourselves in, because the rich don't really breathe much better air than the poor. So with those words, I want to thank everybody who stayed on so late tonight to participate in this. And, and uh, anybody who wants to, um, to, to be in touch with us can write to convener at airqualityasia.org. Thank you all very much. And thank you particularly to the overseas guests, uh, Shazia Rafi, Matthew Nolan, Harry Danoven. Um, thank you all. I think Dorota and Satya seem to have perhaps left us, or at least their cameras are not on, but thank you also to all the young parliamentary um, legislators and legislative aides. Thank you for being part of this. And this is Shashi Tharoor signing off on today's events. Thank you all very much. And on a parochial note, Jai Hind.